Hey everybody. Um, okay, so we got another quick lecture for you. I know that there's been a bunch this week. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, imperfect information, um, other kind of ways that this uh, topic is sometimes referred to is asymmetric information, when one person knows uh, more than another. Um, what else? Um, I think that's it. So remember, if you guys want some office hours, if you guys just want to kind of chat one-on-one -on, -one on how to solve kind of homework assignments and things like that, uh, feel free to reach out to me at mshepherd uh, at gradcenter.edu. Um, Oh, sorry, at gradcenter.cuny.edu. Um, and yeah, let's jump into it. Module 13, part one, imperfect information. This is um, uh, created by Professor Shankar. Um, so more on market failures, uh, asymmetric information. Um, <clears throat> one of the first kind of examples we're going to get into is called the market for lemons. Um, and it sort of explains it in uh, kind of the later uh, later slides. But let me sort of set the table on kind of like what's uh, kind of being described here. So the market for lemons, um, I guess before I get into it, it's, it's worth saying that like um, back in the day it was sort of like a like calling something a lemon was sort of a slang term for saying that something like sucked um inversely you would have like a plum or something would be plum and that was like good um if something sucked and you thought it and you thought it was good uh but you bought it anyways thinking it was good that was called a lemon um this is like uh like vernacular and vocabulary that like no one uses anymore. It was like popular in like the 1950s, um, which is why this paper, The Market for Lemons, um, like the person who wrote it was like coming of age at that time. So that's, if if the language like Market for Lemons like makes no sense, that's kind of the backstory. Um, it's kind of an old timey way of saying that you bought a car and it sucks. Um, okay, so, um, when you're buying a car, you don't know. It's like a used car. If you're buying a used car, you don't know the quality of the car. Um, assuming this is like peer to peer, right? Like you're buying from a like an individual. This isn't like a certified Honda dealer. This is like you're getting off a guy off Craigslist or something. Um, the seller knows the quality of the car, right? They drive it every day. They know that the second gear sticks or that the windshield wiper doesn't work sometimes um whatever they know their car they're selling you this car <clears throat> they have full information about what the the car is the quality of the car you as the buyer you have no idea what the quality is um in these situations of asymmetric information um there's like a high probability that what is going to happen is that the seller of the car is going to use the fact that you don't know that it's like junk and they're going to sell you this junk at a higher price than you would have bought it for if you had known that it was junk, right? Um, the inverse here is, the other example here is um, employee-employee relationships. Like employers don't really know the quality of applicants and then they don't know if they're working hard and that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, okay. One of them is about hidden information. One of them is about hidden effort or hidden action. Um, so the idea of the market for lemons, um, was popularized by George Akerlof. Um, I want to say that it was, I want to say, yeah, so it was a sole authored paper, George Akerlof, 1970. Um, so George Akerlof went on to win, um, the Nobel um, for this. I mean, a, a bunch of other economists. Uh, it was a joint award. It was George Akerlof, Michael Spence, and um, Joseph Stiglitz, and they all won separate awards. 
um, on the same topic, this idea of asymmetric information and kind of like all the pri the problems that can arise. Um, Joseph Stiglitz is local. He teaches over at Columbia, like a couple blocks away. Um, Akerlof teaches in DC. Uh, interestingly, there's um, a very famous uh, uh, economist, uh, woman, Janet Yellen, um, and she is currently, she's currently the uh, secretary of the treasury, um, previously chairwoman of the Fed, um, very, very famous economist. Um, and this is her husband. Um, and it's one of the few instances in the world where she's actually more famous than George Akerlof, who is like a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. Um, I always think that's kind of funny. Um, Janet Yellen is, uh, her research in and of itself is amazing, but I just think the fact that she's more famous is funny. Okay, back to business. Okay, so the market for lemons, you have a car dealership, um, they're selling a lemon and they're selling a plum. Um, and you have like kind of a 50, 50 chance of either, uh, cost to the dealer as described, um, value to the buyer, um, efficient allocation. Give you knew like what the, um, if you knew, um, what the, if the buyer knew what the everything about the car, then like these markets would clear and everything would be fine. Um, so in efficient allocation, all cars, lemons and plums should be transferred from the dealer to the buyer. But because the buyer doesn't know, and there's all this like, you know, probabilistic stuff that happens. Um, okay. So let's just go through that. Um, expected value. Um, so when you get to expected value, expected value is a is a fancy way of saying you have to start like adding in the probabilities and the probabilities here are it, they're 50 50 they're not 50 50 because this is 50 and this is 50 i mean like they are numerically but it's the probability is 50 50 because there's a hundred cars and half of them are lemons and half of them are plums and so you have to take the value um the value times the probability um to get the expected value um i wish we were in person so i could show you this on the board because expected value sometimes like eludes people and they think that it's like you know higher math than it is uh it's actually like pretty simple you're just going to take like the probability of one thing times the value of that thing plus the probability of the other thing times the value of the other thing whether it's like dice political elections buying a car doesn't matter and like anything it's always probability times the value of that thing plus probability of the other thing happening plus the value of the other thing and you can keep going if there's like other probabilities and other outcomes you just keep that chain going and then you just crunch all those numbers then it'll give you some number and that's your expected value um okay uh okay so it doesn't like walk out the math fully, but you're just gonna do half of this plus half of this, right? 50% of this plus 50% of that, that sort of stuff. Um, What else do I wanna say about this? Um, okay. Adverse selection, only the low quality or high cost goods gets traded in the market. Um, Market equilibrium is not efficient. And then uh, both less informed agents and more informed agents lose out to out due to asymmetric information. Uh, here are some other examples. We kind of talked about this in the beginning. Um, market solutions. <clears throat> okay. So I know normally I say that like, you know, public policy solutions are always find something or regulate something. That's kind of true here, but now we also have market-based solutions. Um, and so market-based solutions are things like, uh, you sell your car to a dealer who then gets it like, you know, warrantied or certified or whatever. Um, or also like the buyer could just, before they buy the car, they can get it like certified. Um, government solutions is like, you can require that kind of stuff. Um, 
with employers and employee relationships, when you don't know if like an employee is a lemon, you can require like licensing, uh, doctors, plumbers, electricians, like they all need to get like certifications and licenses and whatever. Um, to be a professor, you need like lots of like certifications, right? Like uh, your, your professor is um, a PhD from an Ivy League school, right? She's a uh, Professor Shankar is like a highly certified uh, like um, instructor. Um, colleges make sure that like the level of education that you're receiving is like appropriate, right? You're not getting like a, a lemon professor. Um, insurance mandates, that's more of the same, um, where like, um, the government is regulating an insurance to kind of clear the gap that if you do buy a lemon, um, and you're expecting a plum that there's an insurance to kind of like clear the market. Um, okay, let's jump into, uh, part two. And I'm going to skip ahead to get to moral hazard. Um, what I want to say about this is that like moral hazard and adverse selection um, are hard to differentiate when you're new to this topic. Um, so if they feel as if like after the end of this lecture, if you're like, I don't quite know how to distinguish moral hazard from adverse selection, um, there's plenty of stuff online. You can just like look up moral hazard, um, get some examples, um, do the same thing for adverse selection until it like, until there's like some clarity there. Um, cause yeah, it, it takes a while. Um, okay. So moral hazard is a person who is imperfectly monitored, finds it optimal to make inefficient choices. Um, sometimes we'll talk about like banking relationships like this where if banks aren't regulated, um, then it's effectively like incentivizing them to make um, sort of uh, like usurious uh, financial choices. Um, uh, a simpler example is just like employee-employer relationships. Like the, the employer doesn't know if you're like a good worker or a bad worker. And so you can kind of like, um, you can shirk Shirking is like you're not doing your responsibilities, or you can you can kind of work hard. Um, and then it's going to be the same, right? We're going to add some expected value, so we're going to put some probabilities to this. Um, so for expected values, remember we need two things: we need probabilities, and then we need the values. Um, in this case, we're given like kind of a a binary choice, like good worker, bad worker, right? Works hard, shirks his responsibilities. Um, then you just need probabilities and values, and then it's going to be as I uh, said before, probability times value plus other probability plus other value um, to get expected value. So it's 80% of 10K, 20% uh, of zero, and then 50% of 10K, you know, you uh, crunch the numbers. Cost of effort is 5,000. Um, expected value, expected, uh, expected profits, expected profits. Uh, what else? Okay. Um, and you can see how like you get these numbers, right? So 80%, just think of that as like 0. 0.8 and then you have 10 K. So if you do 10 K times 0. 0.8, 10 K times 0. 0.8, that'll give you 8,000. And then you just keep going. Plus the other 0. 0.2 is the remainder. Um, times zero because the otherwise it was zero so going to be 8k that's that's where they're getting these numbers from same is going to be true here if you have a 50 percent uh probability that employee makes uh a 10k in profit same thing 10k times 0. 0.5 plus 0. 0.5 times zero so this is going to zero out <clears throat> but just for like the sake of math um because on your homework assignments, this might not be zero. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Mm -mm -mm. So if, empl if the employer cannot monitor the employee's effort 
what would the employer do for a fixed compensation of 6,000? So if the employee is only getting 6K, then what they're going to do is they're going to shirk and they're going to, they're not, they're not going to do the job and they're going to, you know, opt for this option, uh, expected profits of 5,000, right? So the employer is going to make a loss of 1K. This is where hidden actions come in. So person with insurance uh, may not take uh, actions to mitigate risk of the bad outcome. Um, this is like you give someone health insurance and then all of a sudden they start like skydiving without a parachute or something like that. Um, if you can't tell like how someone's like life is, they might just start making more and more risky decisions. Um, managers may not uh, maximize shareholders' profits in a publicly held company. Um, that's for the reasons we just described in kind of like this scenario. Um, and then solutions are um, incentives, right? You can always incentivize things, incentives and disincentives. Um, CEOs receive golden parachutes to incentivize them to undertake uh, mergers that would improve company profits. Um, insurance contracts have co-pays and deductibles, right? So even though you're insured, you still have to pay uh, some kind of deductible when you go get, when you go see a physician. <clears throat> um, it's for a variety of reasons, but like one of them is potentially so that people aren't making incredibly risky um, sort of decisions in their in their off time. Um, okay, so I do um, review these lectures. Um, there's a lot on Akerlof, the market for lemons. This might be one of the lectures that has the most amount of kind of like supplementary material kind of like out in the ether. Um, if you like go on YouTube, you can find like just a million videos on solving like questions like this, like the, you know, do you buy the car? Do you not buy the car? Do you work? Do you not work? That kind of stuff. Um, if this kind of like short explanation of expected values and how to solve it doesn't make full sense to you yet, tons of supplementary material. Um, this is like well charted, uh, territory. Um, and with that, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, is there anything else I want to tell you guys today? Um, uh, I think that's it. Uh, remember my email, mshepherd, uh, at gradcenter.cuny.edu if you guys have any questions. Um, and I will see you guys next week.